packing foam, EPS foam, the white stuff that comes in everything you get these days. That's what we're working with today. We're going to use packing foam to make terrain. It comes in a variety of sizes. You can cut it pretty easily with a knife, but that does tend to make foamy little beads go everywhere, so I tend to avoid that. I usually use a hot wire knife or a hot wire table to do my cutting. You just lay it out in a way that makes something interesting, and using a hot wire knife like here with good ventilation, you uh, can carve it in any shape you really like. It's super easy, lightweight, and if you coat it properly, very durable. Now we're making kind of stone buttes and rock walls out of this. So you want to make sure that you make uneven, kind of jagged cuts around the edges and carve it to look like stone. Stone is a natural product. You find it anywhere in the world. So find yourself some reference images and use those to start cutting. Obviously, soft spots will erode faster than others so you can have dips and crevices and deeper cracks and very irregular shapes. In fact it's so easy to do this I went ahead and made a couple more. There's going to be little stringy bits here and there on it so you're going to want to take those off and if you're lucky someone will get you a real fancy lighter to do that. Again use good ventilation. And you just take it for a second and burn off any stringy bits. Now our friend Mod Podge and Brown Paint is going to be helping us today. In fact, we're going to be coating these three different ways to do an experiment. One will be completely coated in Mod Podge and Brown Paint first, like you see here. Another will be coated in plaster. or joint compound, spackle, whatever you call it where you live, it's this stuff. I like it because it's pink when it goes on and when it fully cures it turns white. And uh, remember it adds a bit of weight. So do be careful when you're handling your freshly coated plaster L-shaped rock wall because disaster is right around the corner just like that. Oy. Fortunately, it's none the worse for wear. A couple of little touch-ups here and it was back to just the way I had it. Now I'm going to show you my basing sludge. All the ingredients are optional. If you take approximately, you know, a lot of your joint compound or plaster, whether it's powdered or this ready mix stuff. You add some water and you dilute it down to it's the consistency of uh, Pepto-Bismol. Don't drink it. Although it looks, smells, and feels exactly like it, I don't think that's their recipe. Then Mod Podge and Brown Paint again. This allows you to know where you've put it on after it's dried. That's why the brown paint is important or black paint. I use brown paint for my uh, terrain basing and I use black paint for my objects like structures and whatnot. Then we're going to add sand. This allows you to have a one-step process when you have this mixed up to just slather it onto your terrain to give you protection and uh, terrain texture. So sand and grit. It works really well. Your consistency that you're looking for is kind of like very watery mud. Using a brush you do not care about, scoop some out and begin slathering it into all the nooks and crannies. And the beautiful thing about this combination is that the layers between the pieces of foam that you've glued together go completely away because, well, this is filler and that's exactly what it's doing. It's filling in all those fine lines so that they go away without destroying the carved detail that you've put into it. Now this one I didn't put anything on it first other than my basing goo, the sludge, and you can see it didn't cover it 100%. And 
Now this one was just the plaster and it did a much better job because the basing goo sludge gripped to the plaster really well, but there's some light spots. And this is the one that had the Mod Podge and brown paint on it first. Seems to me that it bonded exceptionally well to that. And in the future, I'll probably just do that first before putting on my basing sludge. So after some touch-ups here and there, to make sure it's fully covered, we now have fully based things. Now let's take them outside and prime them. Oh, that's right. It's spring in Montana, so that's not an option. I guess it's airbrush time. Now after we've airbrushed these fully with gray primer, like we did in the uh, last video, of course we used a rattle can there, go through and make sure that everything is fully covered with a gray primer, and we're going to do our base coat of this golden brown again. Now I find that if your brush is a little wet when you first start and you occasionally re-wet it, it helps these cheap craft paints kind of spread a lot easier, as you'll see here in just a moment. And get into all of your uh, cracks and crevices with the paint because you don't want any white showing or gray in this case from the primer. Do this to all the pieces that you've done and then you're basically ready to dry brush. The same kind of beige khaki that I used before will be used again today. And it's as simple as this. Take most of the paint out, lightly brush over with a kind of medium soft brush so that you hit all the high points, all the grit. And here we're going to do a comparison. This is after dry brushing. And this is before. So let's make all these pieces match. Just like that. Now our good friend the very old Greek pepperoncinis make the best wash, but you have to wait until they turn completely black like this, otherwise they won't do the trick. When they're still green, I mean, it's a green wash and it's very dilute, it's, it's not worth it. Again with a slightly damp brush, take it and slather it on. You want to avoid big deep puddles because your wash will leave big dark patches if you do that. You want to evenly coat everything like this. Now those recessed places, I've got an experiment I want to conduct today. We're going to take a khaki and we're going to, again with a slightly wet brush here, uh, we're going to take some khaki paint and paint into those recesses that I created with the hot knife earlier. Now what this is going to do is obviously change the color, but we're going to make little puddles of some sort of alien sludge or slime or something. Slightly dilute this so that we get good flow. And it covers really well, this cheap craft paint, especially when you dilute it with a little water. And then we're going to go back and dampen our brush without cleaning it after we get all these places and work around the edges so that we lighten that perimeter to create a sort of gradient from you know solid tan to almost a glaze around the edges as though the minerals from whatever's in these puddles is diluted out. Once we've done that, we need to figure out our color. I've got way too many blues here, so we're going to pick three and create a depth gradient using a little bit of each color, going from darkest to lightest. Again, a drop of water on each one of these drops of paint will help it flow better when we begin painting. Mix it in. We're starting with the darkest at the center. We make a blue dot, and we repeat that, and now come in with the next shade slightly diluted blue and kind of work it into the edges of the still wet dark blue paint. 
we'll repeat that for the next shade of blue again slightly diluted and that'll be our final color that will work all the way out to the edges so it'll create a gradient of dark blue to light blue to diluted khaki once that's fully dried we're gonna do something very interesting we're going to make some sort of water effect now, I've never done this before so the outcome will be as interesting to me as it is to you with that we're going to use a gloss acrylic latex type of paint that will dry clear and a ink and the ink is very translucent even with many coats but we're not going to use a whole lot of it I'm going to mix it up here in this little shot glass with a matchstick the shot glasses I got at the hobby store on sale a couple of years ago I've still got a ton of them make more than you think you'll need because as this dries it will shrink and you might need to reapply as I did so with the gloss acrylic and just a couple of drops of this yellow we're going to create a light filter for the blue as we all remember yellow and blue makes green so it should create a diffused greenish hue within these puddles once it's all said and done now it will take several hours for this to dry once it's applied uh, you could do it like I did and pour it in and wait or you could apply it in much thinner coats over a period of time over multiple steps it's entirely up to you both will work and ultimately has a very interesting color when it's done so here we carefully pour it into our puddles it very much does not look like anything good right now we fill our puddles and then we're going to come back with a brush and break the surface tension and spread it out to all the edges of our puddles so that way it's a whole area effect not just this weird glob in the middle just gently work it around you're just breaking that surface tension and spreading it out to the edges and now using a little bit of fire pop any bubbles that have formed on the surface obviously again keep good ventilation and be careful you don't want to burn yourself or your project and you wait and you wait then you wait some more and then you have a finished product and there they are I think the uh, green slimy puddles turn out really well even though I'd never done anything like that before giving a mineral kind of deposit look around them the deep crevices on this overhang are particularly happy with I think the plaster may have diluted too much of the actual carving there so I may not do that again unless that's the look I'm going for and because of these shapes they create line of sight blocking elevation changes and the capacity to put them in a variety of shapes so that you can use them in different ways on your table. Thank you for watching. Now go have an adventure in crafting.